الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعليه الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> The beauty of religion is of course the presence of God within human life and in every aspect of human life. Now this is where religion is profitable, substantially assists us in leading wholesome, fulfilling, meaningful lives. It connects every aspect of human endeavor intimately with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds individuals of the presence of God and the necessity of entertaining God in every act, in every intention. And of course, God makes us mindful in the Quran that even in your lonely hours, I am there <coughs> watching you. I know what is hidden deep within your souls and what you manifest. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acquires such prominence within the self of an individual, what that does to an individual is that it brings the individual within the present. One of the things that evade human being is the pleasure of life by being lost within their own constructed worlds. Worlds of regret of the past or high-flying aspiration of the future. And as a result, the present, which is the only reality and the only truth, is missed out altogether. It is no surprise that the Blessed Prophet has said, niyam in matu in tabahu, that people are asleep. When they die, they awaken. This awakening means they come into the present. They are aware that I am. And at that point, what happens is that the soul is filled with regret. What religion does is it purges the human being of the condition which is a natural concomitant of our material existence, of the regrets of the past and aspirations of the future. What God does is he purges us of these two poles that are within us that are always consuming us. When we become God-focused and we arrive into the present, we acquire confidence through God Himself, which is extremely liberating. It sets us free of all forms of frailties and inadequacies. And we want to build on this slightly, but I will remind ourselves of that example of the blessed Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <clears throat> and of course there are many examples of his life and they all indicate this. But one example that is very mundane, but in the fact that it is mundane shows how substantively it was improving him and how much at the core of his being there was the presence of God. Somebody gifted him a fruit. Now you've heard this. So he cut a slice and he ate it. Then he cut another one and consumed it until he finished the whole fruit. He turned to the person, thanked him, prayed for him. The person left happily. His companions looked at him and they said, Oh Muhammad, it must have been a delicious fruit that you consumed it all by yourself as opposed to the normal practice of sharing it with us. They said, on the contrary, it was very bitter. So why did you not share it with us? He said, in, in order for you to not to make faces 
or comments that were hurtful for the person who gifted this fruit. Now thereby, what he did was, he secured the feelings of the person who gifted him this fruit and also secured his companions from sinning. And on top of that, he educated them. But all of this was made possible only through the presence of God within his soul at that point. Now, this is something very mundane, an ordinary occurrence of life. But you can see the impact of God in his divine soul at that point. That is in something as little as consumption of fruit and being mindful of those around him, he can be directed so meaningfully. You can imagine a life filled with that God and the presence of that God brings about a state of proper measure within life. Words are not spoken until they are weighed up first. That my God is present with me, within me, beyond me. Not only words, thoughts, sentiments, reactions. Everything becomes well measured. Everything becomes meaningful. And for the first time we begin to lead a proper life in which we are alive. The bridge of life and death can be explained very simply. It's not an extraordinary phenomena as we feel it is, that we are going into unknown territory. No, it is only a crossing from absence of God to the presence of God. The Quran describes this so eloquently. Today, we have unveiled the coverings before your sight and you see as clearly and as sharply as the edge of, edge of the sharp end of the blade. What do you see? You feel the presence and the overwhelming presence of God. This is the beauty of religion, bringing Allah that close to us that he then becomes an integral part of human existence. Everything is then directed through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it creates a very meaningful life, a life in which we are living. <clears throat> now think of our lives without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the presence of God. I'm not talking about the formalistic presence in which we attend Jumu'ah, Eid, Salatul Jama'ah, or five prayers. I'm talking about an intimate presence of God, not a formalistic presence of God. What happens to us? If we were to recount the events of our lives, we will find that there hasn't been those years and days and hours in which we have been alive or present. They have just gone. We have been in a state of loss because time has eaten away at us. We haven't lived that life. <clears throat> but if we could come into the present and invite God at that intimate level of our souls, then we will feel that we are leading a life that is productive, that is meaningful. Two, imagine the problems we get into in life. Our quarrels, our fights which are unending. Why does this happen? Why do communities split? Why do Sunni and Shia kill each other and are unaware to see each other's perspective or the greater truth that is beyond both of them? To be honest with you, in my opinion, there can be nothing more wrong than the Sunni and the Shia. Both of them are equally wrong. When the Prophet said, that there will be, if it is a true hadith, that there will be 72 sects, all of them are in hell. Sunnis and Shias are both in hell, in my opinion. There is none of them are going to heaven because they've all lost God totally. Don't take my comments harshly, you know what I mean, yes? And the fights that we have on a daily basis. Think about all these things, the wastage of time. Where does it result from? The 
calamity upon the human mind where does it come from the inability to break through our molds where does it come from the state of indoctrination that does not allow us to see beyond the truth that stares us in the face where does it all come from it comes from that one thing the absence of god from our lives at that intimate level why do i greed so much why am i so angry why am i unforgiving why can i not tolerate the other why can i not appreciate the good from the other all of this is through the lack of the presence of god at that intimate level what prevents me from transcending my emotional limitations and giving the other that the love the care the goodness that they deserve it all boils down to this one thing the absence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that intimate level of my own being you see when allah is invited to that level of proximity it doesn't matter to me after that what happens to me because i'm reliant on him i always ask myself one question that is a young man whenever i would find a great overwhelming religious authority i would find a lot of comfort in my soul to give over my affair to the control of that authority it would give me a state of security from within truly if we find allah and we feel from within that he has created everything before i came here and once i die everything will continue as it is and it won't make any difference then in that case what it will do for me is it will free me from greed from human inadequacies from anger from these unending aspirations from jealousies from wanting to achieve what i can't achieve from extent and it will allow me to extend the hand of friendship think about it carefully think about the words that i'm saying next very very carefully and as opposed to hating my opponent would i not then become more like muhammad rasulullah who actually loved the human and disliked the disease that consumed that human as opposed to becoming as diseased as that human if somebody is my arch rival and an enemy what cause do i have with him why would i not want to pray for him and endeavor and strive for that person to become a better person and through that for allah to make me into a better person imagine if allah can be invited at that level within our own souls and within our own hearts how he can liberate us and that is the beauty of religion that cannot be got outside religion bismillahir rahmanir rahim wal asr inna al insana lafi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu s salihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bis sabr بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين واله الطيبين الطاهرين اما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمه الله وبركاته now we come to the modern day crisis we all like to point finger at the dahsha isis and condemn them and curse them al qaeda we want to condemn them and we want to curse them Yes? but i want to ask a simple question islam has never been free of these extremist interpretations of the muslim theology so even though we consume even though we curse them we still produce them isn't there now an opportunity for us to reflect more deeply into the situation and ask ourselves a question deep within ourselves that is it not after all our islam the way it stands that allows for such extremist interpretation of our theology is it not time that we acknowledge the truth 
and we stated to ourselves that there is something wrong with our theology in itself. Bear in mind, the communication is one thing, our understanding of it is another. But our formal understanding within Islam, does it not then create that space for such ungodly interpretations? And it all boils down to this absence of God at the level of human consciousness that allows for such extreme interpretations. And then we are so biased. I was at the central mosque with the other imams. But then I saw that the office bearers quickly condemned ISIS. But the imams, some of them who were of the Sufi leanings condemned, but others did not condemn. The whole discussion was derailed. And instead of condemning ISIS and preventing our youths from going to Syria and Iraq, the discussion was this, that we do not need interference from the British government, nor do we need their initiatives. It is our problem, we'll sort it out. But what about the condemnation? The hesitation from condemning it shows that there is something wrong here. On the other side, on the other side, we see these biases that the Sunnis will readily support the people who are the victim of Assad's aggression, but they will not condemn outright, I mean some of them, the ISIS and their behavior. This is so apparent. Then you look at the Shia. It's amazing. They will condemn the freedom fighters or the resistance or whatever it is, Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusr, ISIS, immediately. But they will not condemn the atrocities committed by Assad. It is when you look at these things and you see that the Muslim world is plagued. I don't find any of these people have anything to do with God or with the conduct of the Prophet or the great exemplaries that have gone in history. It is disheartening to see this situation of the Muslim. We have come beyond this point. I think now we will all readily accept that folding arms and opening arms is not a problem at all. But something else plagues us at the core of our existence. There is something terribly wrong. The scholars of Islam are the first people that need to be true to themselves. They need to understand that there is a God who is a loving God. The only way the Prophet was successful was by introducing God within his community. That community was torn apart by wars, yes? by tribal sentiments. He bridged the gap through God, the intimacy of God. That God is not there anymore within the Muslim community. The Sunnis will not outright condemn the atrocities committed by groups calling themselves Sunnis. The Shias will not outright condemn the atrocities committed by groups calling themselves Shias. This is a plague upon us. First and foremost, there is something wrong with our theology. It's become an inhuman theology, ungodly theology. To Beyond this ungodly theology, we have regressed further into blindly supporting what we belong to. I ask a simple question to myself. That majority of the people of this world that I see end up proving the worth of the religion in which they take birth. Can you see that? A Christian will end up proving the validity of Christianity, a Muslim the validity of Islam, a Jew, the validity of Judaism. A Shia, the validity of the Imamat theology. And Sunni, the validity of the Khilafah theology. Tell me, if you were to switch them all around, if you were to make a Hindu take birth in a Muslim household, he, he would be as forceful in defending Islam. And God forbid if I had taken birth in a Hindu household. Imagine how many people I would have converted. I'm giving myself a lot of self-importance. It is at that point that you awaken and you begin to realize 
that the whole essence of our existence, godliness, presence of God, has gone amiss totally. What is required by a true human is to awaken to the truth as the truth stands. Wrong is wrong. Whether it's in the name of Islam, Shia Islam, Sunni Islam, wherever it is, wrong is wrong. Right is right. We need to come back to ourselves, like the community of Abraham, when he broke their idols, for Raja'u ila anfusihim. It was so shocking, that experience, that momentarily the veils parted from their hearts and they went deep within themselves and they saw the truth. They glimpsed at the truth. We need to glimpse that truth and to arrive at this judgment that no, this is wrong, no matter by which name it goes. And two, our scholars need to truly explain and express the teachings of the Quran as they are. Quran is not immoral, it's a moral book. I just want to explain that in two more sentences. There are only two, one or two verses of the Quran do appear draconian, harsh. What is the punishment of the enemy of God but that they should be killed and their limbs should be severed and then they should be burned? It's a verse of the Quran. And you think, wow, why would God say something like this? But if the scholars are righteous and they are true and they are real scholars, they would be able to explain that there were people who converted to Islam and then they mounted an attack on Muslims. They put them to death, they cut their limbs off and they burned them. In response to that action, this verse has come. If the scholars were true scholars, if they really had God at the core of their being, if they understood the moral good God, the example of the Prophet, then they would understand Quran more clearly and they would not allow the Shia and Sunni extremists to go out and barbarically kill children, enslave women, and all in the name of such verses. So the onus is upon the scholars, but now the scholars have failed us and historically they've always failed us. The condemnation within the Quran of the Jewish scholars was actually meant to awaken us in the present, that this is a condemnation directed by the Quran at us. We are hiding the book and we are misinterpreting the book. We are unable to understand the truth for what it is because we don't want to and we are unable to proclaim the truth and we are unable to disassociate ourselves from falsehood. This is a fact. So the scholars by and large have failed but then that means that the person who is a human and a Muslim, the onus then comes upon them to awaken to the truth and try their best to be truthful and to spread this word of truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove this plague from our community that goes by the name of Islam but which is not tolerating any differences and promoting every form of vice. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow the world to forget the atrocities committed against the Palestinians by the Zionist state of Israel. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also allow the people to see the hypocrisy of the heads of Muslim states and the fact that Egypt did not open its borders to the Palestinians under whatever justification was inhumane, was wrong for those people to be trapped in that prison and to be killed mercilessly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten us in our minds to say that that was an equal wrong and they were too to be blamed in the atrocities 
against the Palestinian people. Can we recite a Surah Fatiha for all those poor souls that have lost their lives in this conflict? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya'i wal mursaleen Wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-ma'asumin Wa ashabihi al-muntajibin Allahumma salli wa sallim ala muhammadin al-mustafa